Hey, Mercy Hill, welcome. My name is David McNeese. I am one of the pastors here. Specifically, I serve at our Edgefield Road campus. Shout out to Edgefield. Um, whether you are joining us online or in person at one of our campuses this weekend, we're excited to have you here with us. Before we jump into the sermon, I just want to talk for a minute about our Multiply offering. I know we've spent the last several weeks highlighting, multiplying different ministry lanes that we are praying for God to move and to do some amazing things next year through our Multiply offering. This week, I specifically want to highlight our international missions lane. You see, I know you may be thinking, well, that's the last one that there was, so maybe it's not that important, and that's not the case at all. Listen, the international missions lane is last because we truly believe that if we reach people here, then we can send them there. There's a connection between the campus, community, college and seminary, church planting, and missions. And y'all, we are ascending church, which means we care not just about seating capacity, but we care about sending capacity. We want to make sure that the, that the nations are hearing the good news of who Jesus is. Our missions team would say it this way. We want to send from our neighborhoods to the nations. Many of you may not know this about my family, but we actually spent time as missionaries overseas. And our highlight for the international missions uh, lane next year has me very, very excited. Here it is. The, in this next year through Multiply, we have the opportunity to fuel an underground church movement that could impact what more than any of us could ever imagine or comprehend. The multiplication potential is huge. Listen, we've connected with someone who is directly connected with a group of pastors who desire to be trained and sent among some unreached peoples. Now, I know I wish I could give you some more details and I'm being purposefully vague because of the possibility of persecution, even persecution unto death. But we've made this connection and we have this opportunity to come alongside these pastors who have this heart to reach this group of people that are 99% unreached, y'all. 99%. They've never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. Church, we can literally fuel the training of these pastors. Through your generosity, they will be trained in biblical storytelling, which is a great way to convey gospel truth. It's such a unique opportunity that we have something that we as a church are excited. And I hope that you will be excited about partnering through that as well. We believe that this could be something that would lead to a movement, a world-changing movement, and your generosity can have a direct impact on that. I'm gonna circle back a little bit more to that after the sermon today, but I wanna make sure you are aware of that. So let's jump in today. We're going to continue in our Rediscovering Christmas series. We're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. You know, the other night I was in our kitchen and I heard a really weird crackling noise. And I wasn't sure what it was. I knew our dogs weren't around. And as I went into the living room, I realized that there was a fire on the TV screen similar to this. But not only was it the picture, but it was the exact sound of a fire. It wasn't producing any heat, but it sounded just like it. Now, what's interesting is you may see this or you may know what I'm talking about if you have some kind of device that can pull up a fire. But just because it had another sense, it wasn't just sight, but it was hearing that engaged me, it wasn't any more real. No heat, no real fire, nothing really burning. Y'all, in this series we've looked at how so many times we settle. We just settle for sentimental in Christmas. We, we are filled with shallow emotion, many just little reason of why we do what we do. We have a picture of Christmas that's really devoid of power. And today we're gonna to be looking at another word. Really, it's more of a title or a name. And it's the true reality of what Christmas is all about and it's Emmanuel. So if you're gonna take notes with us here today, this is our big idea. God with us is the heart of Christmas. And you'll see God with us in quotes. We're gonna talk about that. God with us is the heart 
of Christmas. I don't know what you think about in this time of year, but when we have cold weather as we have recently had, maybe you think, man, I just want to go home after work or the ideal evening is snuggling up in front of the fire with a blanket. Maybe it's a heated blanket and the fire both, a real fire, not, not something like this, but something that's going to get you the heat and the warmth that you need. And so many times we think of Christmas in that way as that really warm blanket, especially at this time of year. We just want those warm fuzzies all over us. You know, we want the songs and the food, the movies, the scented candles burning. We want all of those things. But it's not true fulfillment of what Christmas is about. Think about the irony when people who may not be religious at all, not followers of Jesus, are singing a song like Jingle Bells, and then they turn right around and sing Joy to the World, which tells everyone to, pre to prepare room for Jesus, the King. It's all about the feeling and not a real fulfillment. You know, around this time of year, so many people think that they need to do whatever they can do to get close to God. Okay, I need to come to church. I need to put some money in the kettle for the Salvation Army bell ringers. I need to do something to help make me feel better. But Christmas is not about us getting closer to God. It is about God coming to be with us. That's what Christmas is all about. Y'all, we all have a desire, whether you realize it or not, to have God with us. In the mid-1600s, French mathematician, philosopher, and theologian Blaise Pascal said this, the human heart has an infinite abyss. This inability we have to be happy. What else does this craving point us to? Other than that something that once was there is now missing. We used to have it, now it's gone. How can it be that this craving that we have, what was missing, could be restored? You may find yourself asking that question maybe multiple times a day. How am I going to figure out how to make things better than they used to be? To get back to where I feel like things need to be. So whether you're there now or you've been there before, maybe you've been a follower of Jesus for a long time. And maybe you're just trying to figure out what Jesus is all about and if Christmas really even matters. I hope that you'll be willing to lean in and to hear to see what is true today. What we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through our text here in Matthew 1. We're gonna really dig into this name, Emmanuel, and then we're gonna apply this for all of us. So let's jump in, starting in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, in verses 1 through 17 of Matthew, chapter 1, he is, just, he is just given this long genealogy. And the purpose of that is to help us to see at the beginning of his gospel, Matthew's laying out why he's writing his gospel, this book. And it's for us to see that Jesus is the promised king from the line of David and that he is the Christ or the Messiah, the promised one from the line of Abraham. Mary and Joseph, Matthew tells us, are betrothed. They were betrothed, okay? Which in that day, it's more than just an engagement. Okay? A lot of times you may have heard, well, Mary and Joseph were engaged. It's much more than that they were engaged. It is essentially marriage. But without the wife moving in and without consummating the marriage physically. I want you to also note here that Matthew makes sure that we, the readers, know that something is different about this pregnancy. It's not just normal, Okay? He very intentionally wants us to know that there's something supernatural going on here. If you look back at the genealogy, you see all these, example, these examples. Boaz was the father of Obed. David was the father of Solomon. Azor was the father of Zadok. I just want to say those cool names. But then it changes in verse 16. And it says, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. It's different, so we need to take note of that. Matthew continues in verse 19, and her husband Joseph, being a just man was, and unwilling to put her to shame, 
resolved to divorce her quietly. Now remember, betrothal was considered like marriage, okay? So for Joseph to find out that Mary was pregnant, he knew that he had not been physically intimate with her. He knew that. The only possible explanation was that she had been with another man. And so because of that, Joseph had a couple of options. Either he could go in the public, shame Mary in front of everybody, or he could quietly divorce her. Because to end the relationship would be a divorce because the betrothal was that big of a deal. And I want you to see He thought about it and he decided to show compassion toward Mary and divorce her quietly. Y'all, we need to think about this, that even when we don't know all the details, we can still react in a compassionate way. I don't know about you, but I know sometimes I'm the worst at this. Sometimes I get home from work and my wife can attest to this. If she was here, she would say amen and amen. I may get upset and, or angry with one of our kids for something I think they did or something I think they should have done differently without knowing all the details. I just don't know everything. Then all of a sudden, I have to eat crow, as they say, and all of a sudden, then I'm sorry and then I'm compassionate for them. But it shouldn't take me knowing all the details just to be compassionate. Y'all, if we are riding on Wendover Avenue and somebody has a sign asking for food or money, we don't need to know all the details to be compassionate to them. We still need to be willing to show compassion and not want to shame them. Why? Because they're made in the image of God and they have value because they are a human being. In verse 20, Matthew continues. This is Joseph, but as he considered these things, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So y'all, Joseph had made his decision. He knew what he was going to do. But then the angel comes to him in a dream to explain what is going on. And the angel gives him the shock of his life. The baby is from the Holy Spirit. Now, listen, I know for us on this side of history, we're familiar with the virgin birth. But this was not something that's, that they knew or, or even conceived of then. I, I don't know what. There was no reference point for Joseph. I can't imagine what he was thinking. Not only was the baby conceived from the Holy Spirit, but the son born would be called or named Jesus. In the Hebrew, Yeshua, Joshua, because he would save people from their sins. I want you to realize this name at that time in history, still even to this day, is very common among the Jews because they were acknowledging that only God could save. They were consistently looking for Messiah to come, to save them. But the unique thing about Jesus here is that what his name means is what he had come to do, to save people from their sins. And I I can't imagine what Joseph felt at this point. Baffled, puzzled. Is what I just experienced real or not? Have you ever woken up from a dream and thought, Wow, that was crazy. Do I need to see a doctor? That was so out in left field. Around our breakfast table in the mornings, many times our our two girls that are our youngest two kids will talk about, and they'll say, hey, daddy. One of them will say, hey, daddy, I had a dream last night. Can I tell you about it? And I'll say, sure. I'll be listening intently and they'll share And the other sister's like, well, I want to know this. Well, what happened? And it's so funny to hear them talk about all the details. I'm just back, sitting back thinking, wow, 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 really? Wow. But I'm sure that that's happened to you and be like, wow, what in the world was going on? But this is what's so crazy, crazy. And it even just happened this morning. Our youngest was recounting a dream, but at the very end she said, and daddy, it was so real. It felt so real. I'm sure that Joseph struggled at some level with what he experienced in that dream. But here's what's really cool. If you keep reading, verses 24 and 25, 
we know that he obeyed without questioning God. He did not lay down any conditions to whether or not he would do what God asked. And we need to hear this today, y'all. If God has spoken to you through his word, do not delay, delay or postpone your obedience. Because if you do, you may completely miss or get only partially, get partial blessing of whatever he's wanting to do in you. Matthew continues, verses 22 and 23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see here in verse 23, Matthew's directly quoting the prophet Isaiah. Verse, chapter 7, verse 14 of Isaiah. And it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay? Now, so what was going on here in Isaiah's time? And, and why is there even a need for a sign? Ahaz, King Ahaz, was king of Judah. And he was facing a very difficult situation with two armies facing him down and another in the background. And God promises Ahaz that neither of the first two armies will destroy Judah or overcome the people. And God offered to give Ahaz a sign as a promise of what he had already said he would do. But Ahaz refuses. But God tells him, well, since you refuse, I'm going to give you a sign anyway. And the sign is not going to be of your choosing. I'm going to give it to you. And then here it is. It's a baby. How strange does that seem where Ahaz is looking for protection from God and then God says, no, you're going to get a baby. But see, here's what's interesting. Ahaz did not understand. And really, many times we don't either. God gave them exactly what they needed, which was his presence. The promise of God with us. Y'all, when Matthew wrote and applied the prophecy from Isaiah to Jesus, to the birth of Jesus, this is what he's showing us, that Jesus is the miraculous fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. That's who he is, the miraculous fulfillment. Now listen, at the end of Isaiah 7, 14, it says that the name of the son born of the virgin will be Emmanuel. The name itself is the message of the sign. I know we just looked at Matthew 1, 23, but remember, when, when Matthew's writing, he doesn't just say, he doesn't just re re recount this prophecy. Do you remember what he adds? And Emmanuel means God with us. He really wanted to make sure that his readers did not miss the truth of what the meaning was. He needed them to understand the significance of Emmanuel. See, Emmanuel's not just, a, it's, it's not like a name Nobody went around calling Jesus Emmanuel. It's more of a title. To say that God is with someone or a people means that God is guiding them, that he's helping them to fulfill the calling that he's given them. Now, I want us to dig a little bit deeper here. As we have, as we've walked through this text and here in verse 23 Matthew's making sure we understand that Jesus is Emmanuel. I want us to walk through Emmanuel, God with us. So if you're going to continue to take notes, we're going to see, first of all, that Jesus is God with us. Jesus is God with us. Y'all, he's not just another man. Remember back to the genealogy, how Matthew tells us that he's different. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Y'all, throughout the New Testament, the authors equate Jesus with God. He is God. Colossians 1.15 tells us that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, exactly like him. Hebrews 1.3 tells us that Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word was with God. Jesus was there in the beginning before anything existed because he's God. I want you to think about some of the names. I don't know if you've ever done name studies in the Bible, but I want you to think about some of these powerful connections from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Because in the Old Testament, 
God is called Elohim, the creator God. And in the New Testament, the writers tell us that everything was created through Jesus. The Old Testament, God is called I am. In the New Testament, Jesus tells the Jews before Abraham was, I am. In the Old Testament, God is called Adonai, the Lord. In the New Testament, we are told that we must confess Jesus as Lord. In the Old Testament, God is called Yahweh Nisi, your banner of victory. In the New Testament, Jesus says, I have come to overcome the world. In the Old Testament, God is called Yahweh Ra'a. The Lord is my shepherd. In the New Testament, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and my sheep hear my voice. In the Old Testament, God is called Yahweh Rapha, the Lord who heals, the God who heals. In the New Testament, Jesus is known as the great physician, the one who heals lepers, the blind, the lame, the demon possessed, and even raises the dead. In the Old Testament, God is El Shaddai, God Almighty. In Revelation 1.8, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who was, who is, and who is to come, the Almighty. Those are the connections, y'all. Jesus is God. And that truth should evoke praise, adoration, thankfulness from us. That's why Christmas is not just a feeling. It's not just a bunch of warm fuzzies. God stepped into the world for us, to come to us, to show that he is for us. Y'all, we can be like the shepherds in Luke 2 and glorify God. God, praise God, telling everyone, come and see what God has done. Or like the chorus that we sing here, where it says, sinners rejoice with the angels proclaim glory to Christ, the newborn king. We can shout those praises because Jesus is God with us. Secondly, Jesus is God with us. Jesus is God with us. I grew up playing racket sports. I love playing tennis, badminton, ping pong, um, just whatever I could play with a racket. I, I enjoyed. And so when I went to college, I found out that there was a guy living in our dorm that was really, really good at ping pong. And so I thought, man, I need to get to know this guy. I would like to get better. I'm a very, um, I like to win. I can be competitive. So I wanted to get better playing ping pong. And, and man, he was so helpful. He would help me make sure that I knew the, the correct hold and, and how to make good shots. But one thing he corrected me on, I said, he said, David, it's, it's not ping pong, it's table tennis. Table tennis. That's the correct name. So I was like, I thought it was just ping pong. So I looked it up and guess what? It's really the same thing. But ping pong is like the recreational term. Table tennis is really, really serious. Okay, there's not a U.S. ping pong association, but there is a U.S. table tennis association, okay? Just in case you want to join. But listen, as I got better, I got my own paddle. I played in some tournaments. And I always had more confidence and I did better when he was there. Because he would be like, man, no, you, you did that shot wrong. You need, you need to move differently here to get to it. He helped me understand the game better. I learned as he would share that, his presence made a difference in how I played. Is there someone in your life that's similar? Their presence is a difference in your life and what you do. You see, the thing is, is that Jesus came to be with us and for us to allow his presence to be part of everything. That's what he wants. All aspects of our lives I want you to think back to the prophecy from Isaiah. Y'all, Ahaz was hoping for deliverance or protection and God tells him that he's gonna send a baby. That sounds so crazy. But in that pronouncement was something greater than Ahaz or the people realized. It was the promise of God's presence. That promise was exactly what Ahaz needed, exactly what the people needed. Y'all listen, God knows and gives what we need when we need it. 
That's the kind of God we serve. Back in Judah, in Isaiah, Ahaz and the people were facing enemies on all sides. It was bleak. It was a difficult situation, difficult time. And God knew that what his people needed was himself. Fast forward, right before Jesus was born, there had been 400 years of silence where there was no prophet, nothing from God. It's known as the silent years, but God comes forth breaking the silence, declaring, I am coming to be with you. Maybe today you find yourself like Ahaz in the people of Judah, enemies all around you. You're not sure what to do. What am I going to do next? I, I don't even know. I, I feel like I'm, I'm hemmed in from all sides. Maybe you feel like the people, the, the Jews that had not heard from God for 400 years. And you're like, God, please just tell me something. I just need to hear something from you. Y'all, 2020 has been tough. It has been a rough year, maybe, maybe the roughest year that you, I know for, for me, it's been really difficult in different circumstances and maybe it has been that way for you as well. But we need to know and remember that no matter what we've gone through this year, no matter what we're facing in 2021, and I don't, I don't know what that may be, job uncertainty, financial insecurity, I, I don't know what that looks like, maybe just overwhelming sense of fear, Regardless, you need to know the name Emmanuel. I need to know the name Emmanuel, that I, that I know that I'm not facing things alone because God is with me. Y'all, we have always needed his presence, whether we realize it or not. Remember the Pascal quote that I mentioned earlier that the craving we feel, it points us to something that once was there, but now it's missing. I want you to go back with me for a minute to the beginning when everything was created, the Garden of Eden, everything was perfect. God's presence was with Adam and Eve. Nothing was in the way, nothing kept them apart until sin, until the disobedience of Adam and Eve changed everything. Then there was separation, where before there was harmony and peace, consistent presence of God with them. It was replaced with chaos and death and separation of God and man. But from that point, when sin entered into the picture, y'all, God had a plan to restore, to reconcile, to make things right again. He consistently wanted to make sure his people know that he was going to be with them. God told Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Joshua and Gideon and Solomon, I will be with you. He told the people through the prophets over and over, do not fear, I am with you. They will not prevail against you. I am with you. I am with you to save and deliver you. Be strong for I am with you. And then through the Psalms, again, God tells of his presence to remember what he has done, that he is with his people. And then the ultimate fulfillment of his presence comes in a baby. And this baby was not like anyone else. He came to live among his people. He came to live the, the life that we could never live, to die the death that we deserve because of our sin and disobedience, to die on the cross, a, a painful, agonizing death, but then to be raised in victory on the third day, y'all. Raised in victory to show his power. All this to demonstrate that he wants to be with us. I don't know where you are right now, but maybe you don't really feel like he's with you right now. With everything going on in your life, maybe there's a whole lot you just have been thinking about what's going on in our country. Maybe there's some very specific circumstances. You're like, I just don't know where God is. Maybe you just feel so dry in life, like stale Problems and pain are surrounding you and you don't know how to go on. Y'all, we need to remember this truth that God doesn't keep us from problems all the time. He keeps us within those problems. 
Jesus doesn't take us out of the turmoil and pain of daily life, but rather he walks alongside us as we live life. That's his promise to us, to be there with us. Not only is Jesus God with us, Jesus is God with us, Jesus is God with us. When we understand that God is with us, we see that it's individual and collective both. Okay, it's individual because he knows each of us by name, the number of hairs or lack thereof on our heads. He knows our fears, our joys, our struggles, our brokenness. He knows it all. And y'all, he still came for us. He knew everything and he still came for me. But y'all, he also still came for us collectively. He came for a family, sons and daughters, people from every nation, tribe and tongue. He came so that we could be together with him forever, singing praise to him forever, all because he wanted to restore what was broken and be with us. Think about this. The God who spoke the world into being who rules over all creation, named every star, calls them out one by one. The God whose glory and majesty is beyond our imagination. He came to us to be with us, to change us. That's our God. Now you may hear this and wonder, why would such a great God step into and be with his creation? Isn't that above him? Why wouldn't he just send someone else to tell them? Well, on a hot day in June of the year 2000, I met my father-in-law in the parking lot of a gas station off of I-85 to ask him for his daughter's hand in marriage. He said, yes, praise the Lord. So then I knew that I could continue on with my plan. But I need you to understand, my plan was not to go get my best friend to ask her to marry me. Once he said, yes, my plan was for me to go to her. I went, by my, I went by myself. In matters of love, one must go himself. And that is exactly what God did, coming to us. So what is our response? What do we do with this today? And I would say, this is what we need to do. Trust that God is with us. This is our response. Trust that God is with us. Make the true heart of Christmas the heart of your Christmas. Experience God in a new and fresh way. Now listen, we use the word trust a lot of times and it can even feel sentimental in a way. We can throw it around, but y'all, biblical trust is weighty. It's having confidence, assurance, staking your whole life on the belief or person of Jesus Christ. And trust is active. It's not passive. It's actively seeking his presence, wanting to know him more, wanting to be changed by him more. Maybe you're hearing this today and you know that you're not a follower of Jesus. I would ask, realize that you need to be restored. Realize and acknowledge the brokenness in your life, that all around you there is brokenness. Stop trying to fix everything on your own. You know, I, I don't know if you've seen some of these house restoration shows on TV. I think they're pretty big. They're, you know, HGTV has like 40 of them. There's a whole lot of them. But I've been known to watch a Fixer Upper here or there with my wife. And, and, and I like to see what Chip and Joanna are going to do with Shiplap. Have you ever thought about that man you need a little something in your bathroom shiplap boom need to need to spruce up your bedroom Ooh, shiplap boom you got a leaky roof then maybe not shiplap but you know i mean they they find a way to do that some crazy things but why are shows like that so popular i really believe it's because we're drawn to stories of restoration we want to see things made whole because we want to be made whole. I don't know if you remember, but on April 19th of 2019, the Cathedral of Notre Dame 
in Paris caught fire. It was surreal to watch this 850-year-old building burn. And in the days after, there was this huge outpouring in the heart uh, of people around the world to rebuild it, to restore it. And construction is slated to start next year. So far, over $1 billion has been pledged in the reconstruction of the cathedral. And the French government has said, whatever it takes, no matter the cost, we will rebuild this cathedral back to its original beauty. But y'all, in a greater way, Jesus held nothing back in coming to us. There was no cost that he was not willing to pay, taking our punishment on the cross and not just taking it for us, but the author of Hebrews says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He did that for you. He did that for me. So the question I have is, will you trust him? Would you allow him to restore in you what only he can do? Would you repent of your sin and turn to Jesus and be saved today? If you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you can do that today. If you're at one of our campuses, there's gonna be a prayer team after the service that you can come down and talk to somebody. What would it mean to become a follower of Jesus? They would love to walk you through that. But if you're a believer and listening to this today, this is what I would say to you. Allow the one who restored you to continue to work in you. Y'all stop thinking that you got to figure everything out because just as you believed in him, trusted him for salvation, there was no one else that you did. He's the only one that's going to be able to continue to change you. It's only him. And as you are restored, allow the restoration that has happened to you be something that flows out of you to others so they also can be restored. That's one of the beautiful things about Christmas, y'all, is that God's restoring power was never meant to stop with you. It's never meant to stop with me alone. I want you to think back to what, what Matthew tells us in the name of Emmanuel in, in, ver, in 123. Emmanuel is God with us, the beginning of his gospel. Fast forward to the end in Matthew 28. Jesus has already conquered death, hell, and the grave. He's raised and he's sending out his disciples. And this is what he says, go and make disciples of all nations. And then in verse 20, he says, I am with you always. God with us comes. God with us sends us. So what does that look like? In this season, maybe it is thinking about people that you can invite to come to Christmas services. Maybe it's grabbing some of those inviter cards or the shareables that are online. Thinking about people like Pastor Andrew mentioned last weekend, that 10 people you can invite to come in person, 10 that you can send a link to for the online service. Maybe it is really, you're gonna physically go with a church plant like we heard last weekend from from about Paul and Lori and, and Hope Church Reesville, or going to our new campus in the northeast part of the city next year. I don't know what it's gonna look like for you specifically to trust and to follow through, but I do know that it's not just lip service. I know it's not just playing a game, it's not just looking apart, it's not just saying spiritual things while all along knowing I say these things, but I'm just gonna try to figure out how to do it on my own, God. I don't need you. That's not what it is. And if that's where you've been, it's time to let that go. It's time to be real with God and yourself. Listen, y'all, this Christmas, would you be willing to really think about who or what you are trusting in? We all need to be restored. Things are broken, not the way they're supposed to be. But don't buy into the lie and the thought that all we need are more good feelings or warm fuzzies this year. We don't need more sentimentality. We need a savior. We don't need any more fires with no heat. We need the real thing, y'all. Consider that we all need to be truly restored and fulfilled. And that can only come from the one who came to us.
sought us out. Emmanuel, God with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you have come for us. That even in the midst of our junk, even in the midst of our pain, even in the midst of our problems, you broke through the silence and you came for us to know how much you love us. Jesus, I pray that we, maybe in a, a way that we never have before, fresh in a new way, understand Emmanuel this Christmas and submit everything in our lives, in our hearts to you, wanting everything to be about you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. You know, y'all, as I mentioned at the beginning of our time together, our multiply highlight for 2021 tonight is that international missions lane. The multiply offering is open throughout the month of December. And in fact, every dollar given in December goes toward multiply. If you would like to give, you can do that by texting MHGIVE to 41411, or you can visit the give page of our website either way. Or if you are in person at one of our campuses, we have ways for you to give before you leave here today as well. We have been given so much, we can generously give as well. And right now we're going to be able to continue to worship. So if you're at one of our campuses, I would encourage you to stand together right now as we sing about the truth that God is with us. So let's stand and sing right now.